Um, what's exciting about Redbrook is there's nothing like this in New England. Nothing at all. This is a crown jewel of Sea Run Brook Trout and a crown jewel of Sea Run Brook Trout restoration. You might see Sea Run Brookies in other systems. There's actually quite a few in Maine uh, where I'm at these days. Um, but Redbrook is the, the crown jewel and our mission is to take what we've learned here, pit tagging, habitat restoration, a number of other scientific um, procedures, and apply them to other systems in the area so that they can have the possibility, in fact, a probably a pretty good possibility of enhancing their sea run brook trout population. So here we are at Red Brook. Um, Red Brook is one of a number of restorations that we have here on Cape Cod. Uh, I would recommend that if you want to catch sea run brook trout, that you fish the quash net, that you fish uh, Red Brook, and you fish the mashpee, you fish the kunamasset, and the childs. And those those five rivers basically illustrate a century of restoration. Uh, the Mashpee has not been restored, certainly not since anybody remembers. There's no record of rest any restoration. There's been no dam removals. There's been nothing. It's a natural reference stream. It's, it's magical. It's beautifully canopied in. The water's very cold. The fish are very common. It's a, it's a great place to catch brook trout. But that's what a brook trout stream is supposed to look like on Cape Cod. And then if you go from there to the quash net and see what almost 30 years of restoration has been like, good, good, good illustration of habitat restoration there. Then you come here, it's basically 20 years of restoration. So that's a two different uh, types of restoration, two different qualities. We don't have enough um, canopy here, so they're working, hopefully the trustees is working, putting some canopy here so there's more shade to keep the, the water cool and to keep the brook trout protected. But you go to uh, the Mashpee, the Quashnet, and the Red Brook in that order, you could do that almost in 20 minutes if there's no traffic. Um, those are the older restoration streams. The Kuna Mesut is about five years in restoration, also, lots of fish there, and the Childs, about three years of restoration, and lots of fish there too. Both the Childs and the Kunameset have been repopulated from fish out of the Mashpee, um, but those, those populations, we just heard it from Steve today, those populations are doing quite well. So that's another thing we learned here is that you can translocate fish. If you've got a good population and a good habitat, and you know what you're doing, this is what's known as the nearest neighbor theory. You can move fish from one system to another. Uh, the trout you find in this river are average size. An average size fish is maybe five, six inches. You'll get a bigger one, an eight or a ten every now and then. There are larger fish in here. We see from electroshocking almost every year a large fish. We didn't see one this year. They might be seeing one up there now. But uh, one year we saw a 16 inch fish that we knew spent the entire winter down in the salt water. We also know that that fish grew about four inches in that season, which is an extraordinary rate of growth. So why is that fish so big and why is it growing so fast? It knows there's a rich source of fish down in the estuary. So it goes down into the estuary and gets back, comes back up here to spawn. Which is, well, believe it or not, there are people that say that the fishing here 20 and 30 years ago was better than it is today. That's because these guys used to like to fish below the dams where there'd be a big plunge pool and the larger fish would hang out there and they were easy to catch. So you didn't have to go bushwhacking and, and climbing around through stuff to, to catch those fish. So the, the fishing for those guys was better. But I'll, I'll bet you money that there's more fish in here today than there were 20 and 30 years ago. And that's exciting. So the, the habitat has basically expanded because they've taken these dams out. And it wasn't per se a dam. They were more like flumes, which is a, a, a structure that was built so that they could put ports in it so they could dam it up. But over the years, the flumes held the water back and clogged up the river. So there was these big banks of sand behind the flumes and these plunge pools in front of the in front of these flumes. So when they took those flumes out, those are big cement structures. They're like 
one cement structure here, one cement structure here, and, and a cement floor. When they took those out and re, um, re-channeled the river, that enabled the, the uh, Red Brook to be deeper, colder, and for the sediment to move much more naturally. And that was, that's, a, that's a big improvement. They also put a tremendous amount of um, large wood into the system. You probably saw it today. There's, there, there's wood along the banks, there's wood crossing it, there's wood forcing the water over so that the water will go and, and uh, create a, a hole in a riffle and push the water over to create an undercut under the dam, great place for the fish to hide. So that's creating fish habitat by just putting logs in the river. So Trout Unlimited, under the direction of uh, Warren Winders and Steve Angers, spent a tremendous amount of time putting wood into the system. And I, I can't tell you how many logs, but well over a hundred. So the other thing that the, that the logs do is if you put a log here, and the, and the river's flowing this way, it's gonna cause the river to flow this way. So you're going to build natural sinuosity, which, you, which wasn't there before. In some instances, these rivers have been straightened for the cranberry industry. And so if you put the wood in, you can add sinuosity and, and habitat back into the river. And there were at least three flumes and way up in the headwaters, it's nothing but a big cranberry bog and they move the channel over to one side and they will be over time further engineering that channel and putting in trees and wood, et cetera. But that's a to be funded uh, type project and that's a multi-million dollar project. The mission of the Sea Run Brook Trout Coalition is to take what we've learned here on Cape Cod and apply it to other systems. So pit tagging and, and uh, temperature monitoring are, are good examples, but habitat restoration, installation of large wood, that kind of thing. We do kick studies. We've done almost everything down here. So we know what the, what the bugs are doing. We know what's going on. And you, you go to Maine and you say, has anybody ever done a kick study here? And they go, what's that? And today, what we're doing is we're manufacturing fish. We're, by, by creating habitat that was not habitat, we're providing more room for more fish to grow, so we're growing more fish. But I also like to say that uh, some of my work, in addition to growing fish, is to grow fisheries biologists. That I like to have, like we had today, I like to have a bunch of young people here, let them just go crazy. That's kind of how I learned. You never know who's gonna grow up and decide to come back and work here. Study. A lot of what we learned about here came from books that were written in the 1800s. Their books, uh, Jerome Van Crowning Shield Smith wrote a book, 1833, about fishing all of these systems, and he would write about catching uh, uh, two baskets of fish on a tide. And then he'd go in and say, some were two pounds. So we know that kind of fishery existed. Uh, okay, so there are very likely sea run brook trout in Rhode Island but the Rhode Islanders aren't going to talk about them. And I respect that because they're very, very small systems and they're generally on private land. It's a, it's a salt pond with a creek that runs out of it. Um, that's, a, that's a cold creek kind of a thing. But it's, 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 it's uncommon, but it's, but it's there. And the funny story, we had a conversation with the Rhode Island uh, fisheries biologists and I said so how are the how are the salters doing in Rhode Island and the guy said there are no salters in Rhode Island and I said okay so what are those brook trout in uh, Prudence Island and he goes oh you know about those so they're there but they don't talk about them now Connecticut it's kind of the same thing they should be there but the state has chosen to have brown trout in the coastal facing streams and the brown trout probably eat the brook trout. There are brook trout, there are sea run brook trout, but they're fewer and far between. And of course, on Long Island, the Carmen's River, there are a number of hard to get to rivers on the outside of uh, Long Island where they're all salters, but it's 
very sparse and very private and very hard to get to. Uh, up in Maine, I learned from some scientists about this thing called eDNA. You've probably not heard of eDNA. eDNA stands for environmental DNA. And what it means is from a liter of water, a bottle of water, we can detect the presence or absence of DNA of brook trout. So I can go to a certain river, take some water, freeze it, mail it up to Maine, and get a result back as to whether they're fish in that stream or not. And we can do it for smelt, we can do it for herring, we can do it for a number of, of species, and it's relatively inexpensive. So I got a small grant from the Trout Unlimited chapter up on the North Shore, the Northeast chapter of, of uh, Trout Unlimited, to do eDNA on all the coastal facing streams on the North Shore. And what did I find? There are virtually no coastal facing streams on the North Shore that have any sign of brook trout. Rarely we found signs, but we were able to trace that back to stockfish. Uh, there, is, uh, there are two tiny little systems on the Merrimack that are supposed to have sea run brook trout, but I couldn't find any. We couldn't, we couldn't figure that out. But there's one exception. There's a brook in Manchester by the Sea that has sea run brook trout. It has, it has brook trout in a coastal facing stream, put it that way. I don't think they can run to the sea because there's a rather large obstruction in the way in terms of a golf course. So I don't think the, the brook trout traverse the golf course to get down to the sea. But above the golf course, there's a small population of brook trout. And we may be working with the state to try to do something with that population, rescue that population, translocate that population, something to save it. Because it's the last known wild brook trout population on the North Shore. Uh, my name is Jeffrey Day. I'm the executive director of the Sea Run Brook Trout Coalition.